To be mean when I speak as to what we agree, but which we today do I really want to be in, or even more so, which we are really even ready to see. For I can be that young woman that you want me to be, but does that include the reality of he being with me while I'm fighting the desire to be with she, or vice versa? No, but that can include the perceived habit of my tattoos or piercings or my sexual acts of promiscuity and what's monogamy? Misunderstood because I don't know or see or have been told of my true inner beauty. Or the fact that I was stripped of my innocence at an age so tender, yet it's my flirtatious ways, stripping days and hoarse acts that everyone remembers, but that's no excuse. But to demean when I speak is to what we agree, so do I expect you to understand that while in church hearing about the man who has the master plan? That my mom constantly wonders on how that black or how that blitz is going to do the trick and give me a mental fix for out of my house I was just kicked. And I pay some of the bills, but that's no excuse. For to be me when I speak as to what we agreed, although in the mathematical equation two's company and three's a crowd, it was mama, daddy, cousin, and uncle trying to get a piece of me when no one else was around, but I had an attitude when I was quote unquote being rude and wanting to be alone. But that's no excuse. For to be mean when I speak as to what we agree, but when I say I do, am I really expected to fall to my knees? Mm -hmm. Understanding, yes, that two become one, but is it okay to accept mental, physical, emotional, and or sexual abuse all in the name of the sun? Mm -hmm. While people are constantly turning their heads saying it's not in their beds, and when 911 is called on their faithful day, oh, I knew something horrible was going to happen, even with the paper trail is all they say. But now it's too late. Yet your support, help, and encouraging words could help you choose a different fate. But now it's me plus of state. For it was here, I on the day that would die, and I just blinked out and saw red. I can't even lie. But that's no excuse, because I'm the one who called the cops. Mm -hmm. But to be mean when I speak as to whether we agreed or to have a drink yet go to or help out in church is wrong indeed. Although the hurt inside me no one sees. Mm -hmm. As I wash it away, the facades put on day by day, for I was always considered a disgrace. Because I was the wrong height, color, gender, sister, or brother, wrong profession, musical lesson, wrong voice, or partner choice. Too high, strong, and sensitive, or too out the box and menacing. But to be mean when I speak as to what we agreed, as long as I'm that Bible told straight lace, no pork eating Christian won't touch the edge, although we all crazy in the head. Mm. If I think it, it gotta be wrong, if I say it, it's never right, and regardless of what I do, it's never close enough to the light of the S O N that is. So do I look the same as when I started out? Did you close your ears because you're not ready to hear what I'm talking about? Because I'm here and this is me, but times three. Mm -hmm. For the Father, Spirit, and Son got this one. Because they accept me as I am and help prepare me for the master's plan. For to be me when I speak is to what we agree. For to be me when I speak is to what we agree. For to be me when I speak is to what we agree. And the truth is, these are all realities. Oh. You just don't know which one is you. I just don't know which one is you. Like you don't know which one is me. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To welcome you to this panel. Uh, survive and Punish, Policing Survivors of Sexual and Domestic Violence. Mm -hmm. just want to open up, before I give brief introductions to our brilliant panelists, with a quote from Marissa Alexander, uh, who is a uh, black survivor of domestic violence, mother of three, who tried to invoke stand her ground when she defended herself from her abusive husband, who tried to kill her, and they did not allow her to do that. Um, she said, when you, well now, I'm, I'm, this is a paraphrase, but she said, if you do everything by the law, but the law isn't for you, mm -hmm. where do you go from here? Mm -hmm. This panel is really special because mm -hmm. we've been talking about domestic and sexual violence pretty much the whole time. But when you really focus on it as a, as a core topic, mm -hmm. you realize that the work that we're doing to um, abolish police. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that, but go ahead. It was just shining on Nini's face. OK, cool. So um, the work that we're doing to abolish police, law enforcement violence, ICE, and all the other awful carceral institutions is connected to our responses to domestic and sexual violence in our communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They go together, yes. right? Mm -hmm. We have to do one with the other. Yes. Just want to say that um, when we think about domestic and sexual violence in the context of prison and police violence and immigration law enforcement violence, 
Um, it's really easy to do the thing that the, um, that the immigration panel earlier was critiquing, which is this idea that survivors of violence are exceptional and shouldn't, you know, because they're survivors of violence, domestic and sexual violence, they're the ones that should not be subject to police violence. That's not the way that we want to think about it. The way we want to think about it is that it's structural, that uh, the state, uh, partial systems, police, prisons, ICE, the military, and all these systems is the central organizer of all gender violence. So, again, I'm so happy to welcome the panel so that they can break that down for us. Lydia Salazar is a Latinx queer femme organizer, advocate, and survivor of violence. She's a co-director of Community United Against Violence. I'm just going to give you the brief summary. Um, the Co-op is an amazing organization that's been doing uh, radical anti-violence work for many years. Nanhee Jo is a loving single mother, undocumented Korean, and survivor of domestic violence. After fleeing to Korea with her child to escape her abusive partner, she was charged with child abduction. You heard Sarah Hussein and Stacey Sutton talk a little bit about her case earlier. Mimi Kim is a longtime advocate and activist working on issues of domestic violence and sexual assault, especially in immigrant communities of color. She's a founding member of Incite Women, Trans, and Gender Nonconforming People of Color Against Violence and the founder of Creative Interventions, a resource center creating and promoting accessible models and tools for alternative community-based interventions to interpersonal violence. I mean, it's just the, the wealth of knowledge is just overwhelming. After spending years in the California Institution for Women, Romarilyn Ralston earned a BA from Pitzer College in Gender and Feminist Studies, and then a Master's in Liberal Arts from Washington University in St. Louis. She's a member of California Coalition for Women Prisoners. She is, uh, she works with, oh gosh, I just forgot the name of the organization at Cal State. Project Rebound. Project Rebound, an incredible organization um, in California State University in Fullerton, and she's a member of Survive and Punish. Uh, please oh, I came to America almost 15 years ago now. I was I was a student, I went to the study film. So I came to America, I was in LA, and then I didn't like LA, so I moved to other place, and I thought, hmm, Sacramento, capital of California. I expected a capital, but it was actually, when I came to Sacramento, I was like, wow, it's a capital, all right. <laughs> anyway. So I went to some class. I, 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 I took the, some the photo class and I met the, some guy who looked like hmm, different with me. But somehow we had we started a date and then because I had to take a photo, so we went to many flights together, I took a photo and took the photo together. And then we got closer and then one day I got pregnant. He, he was a freak out and he just gone away from me. So I gave up rest by myself at the hospital. I don't know any family member in this country. I don't know how, how I could do that before. <laughs> anyway, and then I raised my daughter. And then one day I met the big guy, my baby's biological father, again at the campus. So I thought about a lot of things because. You know, I'm a Korean, Asian, so we think about like, what's good for baby's future. So we try to work uh, and work together. But it doesn't really work because he was a veteran, so he had uh, brain damage. So sometimes he's just fine, peaceful, but sometimes really violent. So I called the police a couple of times because I got really scared. And then and then one day, he really physically hurt me. So I decided, and there is many other reasons too, because I thought it's really dangerous for my daughter too. And 
same time, I was an immigrant and then my green card was denied. It. So I called to ICE, hey, what should I do? And they say, oh, you should leave this country immediately. So I didn't have a choice. I had only one year old daughter. And then the guy who's my daughter's biological father, he doesn't really care and he won my violence. So I went back to my country. Um, I raised my daughter for five years, and my daughter became almost six years. Time to go to school, so I came back. I came back to Hawaii because I thought maybe it's better for my daughter. My daughter is mixed, you know, so I thought maybe there is better. But that's like, I don't know what, how it happened with this kind of thing to me. It's like, like a movie, seriously. Like when I got the airport, everybody passed, but they didn't let me go. And then they try to check, and then I can see the police is coming. And I was freaked out, and what's going on? And then they arrest me there. I didn't know that what happened, and they say, they just, do you know this guy? That's my daughter's biological father. So yeah, I know. Then way later, I heard my charge when I tried out this. So, right? I kidnapped my own child, who I gave a birth by myself, and they raised by myself. But oh, how is it possible? It's like just, if anyone has common sense, just let's think about it. How? And then later, I start think, okay. I don't know how, but it happened. Let's think about why. Why? Why they want me to convict them? Why? That's, I still think about it, but I got some answer. That's my short story. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ro Marilyn, and thank you so much, Elisa and Andrea. And all the organizers that put this event together. I'm so honored to be here today and to share a little bit about uh, who I am and the work that I've been doing and um, just have a conversation with these fantastic, brilliant people uh, here on the stage. Um, this is a little history about um, where I come from. I was born and raised in St. Louis. That's Missouri. For some of you Californians that don't get out of the state much. <laughs> and um, I was married at age 17, uh, junior in high school. So I married my um, high school sweetheart, my first boyfriend. And um, I also experienced my first uh, fight ever in life with uh, this man at 17. So the abuse started uh, from the onset of, of the time we got married. So over a course of five or six years, it just escalated into not just physical fights um, and other acts of violence, but also um, trying to kill me twice. So I, I fled that relationship to California, but I fled that relationship very traumatized and uh, very angry and um, very confused. And I came to California, you know, the Golden State, uh, in the 80s, in 1986, and with all of my issues, quickly found refuge with another dysfunctional uh, relationship, which led to my imprisonment a year and a half later. So I was incarcerated at age 24 in 1988, and I spent 23 years at the California Institution for Women um, for a serious violent crime. And I want to share um, what's more important in what I've, what I've done is what happened, the why. The why for me was, you know, looking at one of the largest women's prisons in the world back in 1989 when I was there. 
uh, housing 2,800 women and busloads and busloads coming in every week, asking why is this happening, and starting to um, ask questions to some of these women about how they come to this place, and understanding, as, as Andrea said yesterday when she opened up, that you know, since the 1980s, the incarceration of women has risen 700%. And 60% of those women had children under the age of 18. And 90% of these women have experienced multiple traumas. And these traumas come from communities, and they come from sexual violence, comes from domestic violence, physical violence, emotional violence, state violence. And we are then placed within these prisons, these structures that continue to violate, uh, uh, incapacitate to some degree, and to also continue to silence and rob us of our agency uh, when we've been already uh, abused and um, relegated into these cages. And so I hope to speak a little bit more about my experience inside the prison over those couple of decades and talk about the policing of our bodies inside and how the surveillance of uh, prisons uh, continue to traumatize and re-traumatize women while they're inside. It's, it's, a, it's a constant, consistent presence of corrections um, regulations, um, stigma, um, shame, um, embarrassment, and oftentimes abandonment by our families that continues and per perpetuates the violence against not only our bodies but our minds. And so I hope we can get into some of this conversation later. And again, I just thank you, Elisa, for having me as part of this panel. Hi, it's so good to be here today and you know I'm feeling really relieved to know that um, this is a space for us to, to talk from a place of, of our truth, of our knowing, of our experience. Um, I, uh, before I came to Kuwa, uh, I had gone through uh, childhood abuse, domestic violence in my own relationships and uh, um, I was uh, partying a lot to cope with that violence. Mm -hmm. um, and I was drinking, and I um, went to a club, uh, a queer club in LA, and uh, I was um, going to my car to sleep in the car, um, and I, as I was opening my door, I um, heard a a police officer in the back, and he told me to put my hands up, and he said, you know, I don't even remember what he said, I was drunk, um, but I remember that he said to put my hands up, and um, and uh, he came towards me, um, and he had me blow into the, the breathalyzer test, and uh, said things like, you know you can blow harder, you know you can do this, you can, um, come on, you've done this before. Um, and I remember feeling uh, so alone at that moment. Um, at that time, I was working at a sexual assault center, um, and I was working with survivors of violence. I saw police officers on a daily, um, a, every day um, of my work week, um, and um, for some reason, I thought that by sharing that, I would, um, the officer would stop harassing me. He didn't. You know, he didn't stop harassing me. Um, I was, uh, I was uh, set, I was taken to a, a male's jail because it was the closest one around. Um, and so I was uh, put into a room by myself. Um, and while I was in there, officers kept coming to check on me and, um, you know, making comments like, oh, you're really pretty, what are you doing at a, I don't know, uh, what were you doing at that queer club or, you know, that gay club? Um, and I was like, I was just didn't know what to say or to do. I felt like I had to tell the truth, so I started explaining myself. I started saying things like, well, I'm a lesbian, and da-da-da-da-da. And 
They're like, you're, you're too pretty to be a lesbian. And um, I remember feeling like I, uh, I remember feeling like I was bad. And that, that like I, I, nothing I ever did before getting arrested was mattered. That I was just this bad person. Um, I had to, I spent a week and a half in jail, and then I got released. I got, um, they charged me for other charges uh, besides that. I was carrying my sister's ID, and they tried to get me with identity fraud and a lot of other things. Um, and so I spent some time in jail, and I had to hide the fact that I was in jail um, from my employer, mm -hmm. and it was really hard to keep that. I'm like, shoot, this is the only job I have. I gotta, I gotta, um, I gotta pretend like nothing happened. But um, luckily, after that, after uh, after that experience, I moved to San Francisco, I moved to the Bay Area. I found Kulov, um, and I just feel so blessed to have found that place because it was when I got to Kulov that I learned that um, that that. I didn't deserve that treatment. That I didn't deserve to be. Um, that I didn't deserve to be further uh, abused by by the police, right? Um, and that uh, I started doing. Um, I started seeing people peer uh, doing peer advocacy counseling, which we do at Kuwa. Kuwa is an LGBT anti-violence organization, and uh, we support survivors of domestic violence, hate violence, and violence from the police. And so we primarily work with uh, LGBTQ, Black and Latinx, uh, low-income LGBTQ folks. Um, and so I, I was seeing a therapist outside, but I also did a lot of healing in, in Kuwaf with other survivors. And I think that that's what was truly um, transformative for me, um, to be able to, to own my, my humanity, to take back my dignity alongside other people um, that were uh, uh, criminalized for surviving. So these were survivors that, you know, also survivors that had reached out for help um, when they were uh, uh, leaving their abusive relationship or attempting to just um, survive. And so uh, over the last, in, in 2017, so last year, there's been an increase of, um, um, reports by domestic violence survivors that say uh, that their, their abusers have been threatening them, threatening them with ICE and, and deportation and often told like, oh, police aren't gonna, the police aren't gonna believe you because you don't know how to speak English or you don't know how to, how to um, or you don't have any papers. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, we know that this is true at Kura because time and time again we um, see survivors that uh, that have been arrested. Um, for example, one of our longtime uh, members at Kua, she's a trans uh, Latinx survivor of violence, um, Cecilia. She's spoken about her story before, um, and she she uh, called the police um, to get help. She was being beaten by her her abuser. The police arrived, and the pro police did not provide her an interpreter. She's limited English proficient. Uh, she spoke limited English, and um, she was harassed by the police and told, "Hey, we're not gonna. Uh, you speak enough English. You you don't act stupid. You know what you're talking about." And then uh, accused her of fighting with her abuser, saying, "Oh, you're just. It's just a fight. You both are getting arrested. Um, you guys are fighting." And um, on the way to the police station. Uh, Cecilia had to use restroom, and they made her use restroom in front of them. They continued to say, um, they, they started saying transphobic uh, uh, slurs to her, and, and, um, and she was arrested, spent the, the weekend in jail, and then was handed off to ICE. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how that happened, because Cecilia has asylum. And so the, the ICE, um, came to the police station, uh, and then she was released after, the, you know, after questioning her and then um, realizing that she had um, asylum status. Uh, 
And so this is, these are stories that, that we hear at Kuwab all the time. Um, and Everybody, I, I guess I could talk without visuals for a second. <laughs> Um, I'm Mimi, and I just want to start by saying it's been a little bit of a love fest here. I don't know, if, I don't know how many else, how many other people are feeling it, but there's this particular event brought together a lot of us who um, have been organizing through Insight. Some of us since 2000. Um, some of us uh, starting a little after that, and so it's been just a really wonderful. Um, opportunity here to see so many people that we've been co-conspirators with, um, have been scheming with, have actually come up with our own projects, have cried about our own projects, um, and have made new ones and come up with several books in between, apparently, a, cu a couple of us. Um, so uh, it's been really lovely. I, I don't know everybody here, but I imagine that everybody has kind of like similar connections that they're making here, or just made here today. So I really want to thank you, um, Andrea and Lisa, for bringing us together. Just, that's part of my personal story, I think, has been um, this journey that some of us have been together on for the last 18 years. 2000 is 18 years ago. Oh my god. So, um, so someone want, I want to talk about here. Yeah. I think we want to step down so oh, we can okay. see Sorry about that. No, no, no. Um, some of this is a, I've gotten kind of, um, I, I remember starting out in, um, I might have been actually at Co-op when I first did my first PowerPoint, it was terrible, but I've really become quite enamored of the PowerPoint because I can shuffle it around, I can use it to kind of figure out what I was going to say next, and um, uh, sometimes you can make pretty little pictures. So I'm going to use this for my part, and um, thank you for getting off the stage, I'm sorry for moving you for this. Um, so I'm going to do the I'm gonna kind of look here, so I'm going to jump down here. And um, I'm going to just, this is a little journey. I'm not quite sure how this journey is going to go or flow or make sense. But some of this is also my journey and the journey of some of us who have been considering ourselves part of the anti-violence movement, part of the feminist anti-violence movement, part of the same movement that some of us are calling carceral feminism, right? So kind of see, like really having that dance between um, really identifying with a movement that really has saved lives in many ways, and actually uh, then also identifying with a movement that has um, led to the destruction of so many lives at the same time, right? Or, or killing the spirits and souls and not the very bodies of, um, of our people. So this is a struggle that I continue to be engaged in, that I still consider myself with one foot in the anti-violence movement, and as much as some of us talk about why are we trying to reform the carceral system, right? Some of us are thinking, why are we trying to reform the anti-violence movement? And many, many times I wonder that. And yet, I still feel engaged in that, but it's from a place of many of my um, sisters here in this room, a place where we actually had to craft our own organizing space that was autonomous from the anti-violence movement and autonomous from our connection to the carceral system in order to center our own people and our own struggles and to do things that the way the way that we thought would most benefit ourselves and our people that made most, the most sense. So that is, that's really the um, kind of the center of my trajectory and I also go in between other spaces partly because I feel like maybe there's still a reason to do so and sometimes I like to be a spy. So, um, some of what I'm going to be presenting today is uh, a little bit of both, a little bit of all of those things, and so sometimes I'm not quite even sure where I am myself in that dance that I have to do, and as many of you have to do, as we're doing right here, because we're sitting in a university, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, CRG, for the food. So, um, <laughs> you know, and you pay for everything. So, we're, you know, we, we all did that, right? So, um, this is, you know, you know, decoupling safety from crime control. Old stories and current trends. Um, so, the old story. How is it that we saw emancipation through incarceration? Because that's what we did. So, this is an old picture. Jail rapists, not victims. And in so many ways that might make sense as a feeling that people have. And yet, I think we know that we had 
as a result of that kind of campaign and that kind of request and that kind of demand is that we ended up, yes, putting many people in jail or justifying that people got put in prison. This is um, a men of color prison, but we also have women of color in prison, right? So this is what we've been talking about all day and that um, Andrew's book attests to. Um, <clears throat> an old story, so just an old story, I'm going to do a little bit of, some of this is very familiar to you, for some of it, for, for some of you might know these, but it looks different when you see it, you know, in a visual. Um, most of you probably have seen this, which is the rates of incarceration in the United States. This dates back to 1945, but if you went back to the 1920s when these statistics were first, um, gathered, you would have a flat line that goes all the way back to the 1920s. And what you have right here is, in 1973, so what some people call a punitive turn, <clears throat> where rates of incarceration then increased by 500%. Only to slightly dip now, which, you know, we're happy about that. But when you have a curve that went up that high, and you have a slight curve, um, you know, we have to wonder about the, what kind of victories we're looking at. <clears throat> what I didn't realize when I kind of started on this historical journey for myself was that, wow, mm -hmm. if I look at my own, which I've mostly been um, I think more involved in the anti-domestic violence movement than the anti-rape movement, although they're, they're intertwined in the United States for some reason, things get divided that should not be divided. Um, we look at the same date, and I have to say when I discovered this, I was, I, I, I was pretty shocked. Maybe some of you are not, I was. I knew that we had really intertwined ourselves with the criminal legal system, but this, the timing was just kind of astounding to me. So that does not mean that we caused this. Carson women doesn't cause this, but that there is a very, very intimate relationship between these two kinds of struggles, as we know, as we've been talking about all day. Um, so I really also looked historically to kind of figure out how is it that people who, some of whom were really against the police state at the time, ended up turning to the police state in order to find a solution to domestic violence and sexual assault. How did that happen? So um, one way of telling the story is this, and I, I could have a whole, I'm gonna to try to make this really short and simple so I don't have very much time. But there is, was in a way, if we look at the early, 19, the early 1970s, where really, actually, the carceral state didn't give a shit too much about domestic violence. They weren't doing anything. So in some ways, it made sense that people made demands of the state, as we do now. So some of this is a story about an old story, but yet a current story, and maybe a future story about how we make demands of a carceral state, and what are the, what are the results of those demands. So we have made demands of a carceral state to do something about domestic violence and sexual assault here. So you could call, call this, you know, finding the state, people involved in a struggle, people protesting, people making demands. But the ways in which some of those demands were made were to actually engage the state to make partnerships. So we have to think, every time we make a demand in the state and then we want to form some kind of institution that bonds us together with them, or we have to continue to do trainings together with the police to make those demands stick, what is it that we're doing? And if we look at this old story, it's a story that can be happening right now today. So we started with contestation, but we ended up making demands that led to collaboration. And there are different things, like the Victim Witness Program, for example, that we see today. Some people know of SART, the Sexual Assault Response Teams, or CCRs, the Community Coordinated Response. That these are ways that we've institutionalized, that we have a partnership and an ongoing relationship with the criminal legal system. That in some ways makes sense, but in other ways it really has led to um, you know, the situation we're, we're in right now. So we had collaboration, I just put the little feminist sign there because there were certain ways in which really uh, some of the early feminists thought, oh, well, we're really outwitting. We're outwitting the state. We got them to concede to our demands. And we did this, you know, using all kinds of kind of surreptitious means. But what happened? After a while with collaboration, you actually lose, when, you, when you're 
constantly doing collaboration with the state. With the car still say, do you are you constantly in control of that? Mm -hmm. No. So it's soon after that you actually uh, start losing um, the position of feminist control that you start then replicating these kinds of models that you set up that become uh, situated not only some of the started in Oakland and San Francisco, not only there, but it can, you know, St. Louis and uh, Duluth, Minnesota is where some of this started. Um, and you, for now you find, you'll find this in every state and every, every jurisdiction. So we have a hybridization. So when you have institutions that form that link feminist advocates or social movements together with the cops or the district's attorney, after a while you can't even tell who's who. You start blending in, you start becoming um, a hybrid of the two. After a while, you have this replicating everywhere, and you have an increasing occupation of a social movement that in the 19, early 1970s, the Carson State did not give a shit about, but really started giving a shit about, because that's what we demanded. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you are no longer in control, you are no longer victorious. You're wondering why you're have to, having to follow the guidelines that were out of the Violence Against Women Act that you actually demanded. So this is just one uh, kind of simple visual to show a story that I think has definitely happened within the anti-violence movement, could happen in any movement. And it's something to really watch out for. So um, here I said, if we, would, if we call these steps to a dance, we might call the dance the carceral creep. <laughs> so that's the... Oh my god. I got to the point. I used to crack up so much when I showed that picture. I couldn't even, could barely even go on. But okay, so... Um, we're going to go on now to um, new stories. Um, that we actually have so many organizations now really seeing, like organizations that I'm particularly looking at that are looking at um, gender-based violence or domestic violence and sexual assault. They're saying, you know what, something went wrong here. We really need to do something different. We're not exactly sure what it is. We need alternatives. We might call them community accountability. We might call it transformative justice. Yes, I'm sure most of you are familiar with those terms now. Um, but we could say as a result of this carceral creep that's happened, that really still the great, great you know, boulder, if you want to call it the hegemon, is really still carceral feminism. But what I want to show, and this is, a, this is that little graph of the rates of incarceration, what I do want to show is the efforts of so many of us and many of us in this room today to really take that down that there has been a movement. Um, I want to start with um, some, at least for me, and I know there's forerunners to this, so this is um, kind of out of the lens of my lifetime um, and my activism. If we look at 1998, the founding of Critical Resistance, who was there, 1998? Oh, yes, I'm sure, I'm sure, I think you organized the conference. Um, so, yeah, 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 Insight. Who were there? Yes, yeah. yeah, some of the people, 2000. Um, so a lot of this, as Andrew was talking about, us being here today, was grown out of it. It's not like, yay, this organization. What it was was, yay for our efforts to form an alternative collective space. Where we start together, money or no, you know, we, you know, we just figure out like this probably today, <laughs> ways that we were going to get together and, and scheme. Mm -hmm. And not just scheme, but do things. Produce intellectual material, sometimes too intellectual, <laughs> not very accessible, but also to really start doing new practices. So some of those new practices came out of realization that we were building a critique of carceral feminism or the carceral state, but we were also really short on pragmatic solutions. And so those are some of the questions that people have been asking, like what have you been doing? And we see these, these struggles that happen, for example, Emmy's story, which was lovely about people organizing to really support the safety of somebody in a homeless encampment, only to have that taken down with the state, right? So we're always um, uh, engaged in that. So we had inside um, Generation 5, I want to give a lot of credit to Generation 5 um, out of the Bay Area, 
no longer an organization, but we did a lot around promoting transformative justice, particularly looking at child sexual abuse. And then we had a bunch of organizations that started saying, you know what, we gotta try this, we gotta plant this. And so this is where Creative Interventions, um, that, uh, that was an organization that were you involved in that? <laughs> so some of you know that out of that came a 600-page toolkit that was, is so accessible. Um, I'm going to blame Rachel. She, she wrote a 599 of those pages. <laughs> um, so we did, we did a pilot project. We were like, let's just try it. We're just going to do it. And um, you know, anybody that calls us, we're going to see. And we basically were like, we're going to see what comes out of it. We're going to do things really differently. We're going to do it collectively. We're not going to involve the state in anything. Um, and, and see what happens. Um, Cara, who here is from Cara? <laughs> yeah, so we have folks from Cara who really, really, I mean, actually started before 1999. Oh, there, okay. Um, now I'm getting into it. Okay, I got to, okay. Well, you see all those orgs there, so that's a lot of them that came out of the mid-2000s that we're really trying to do practice. Um, a little bit like, uh, what do they call it, 201 or whatever, uh, uh, Bay Area Transformative Justice uh, Collective and Project NIA coming out in the um, later 2000s. And then we have Say Her Name, um, 2012, and Survive and Punish, 2015. So these are like the organizations, many of whom were, have been represented on these panels today, that have really been taking down carceral feminism. Take it down. Take it down. <laughs> so just a quick note about Survive and Punish, no. and then I'm going to um, take Mimi's cue and ask the panelists to talk more about envisioning um, where we go from here. Um, so again, the panel is called Survive and Punish. Um, where does that come from? Well, it's an organization, um, Survive and Punish, that was founded by the campaign uh, to help free Nanhi, right? Stand with Nanhi, which is a, it was a local campaign. Um, the national and Chicago-based um, uh, efforts to free Marissa Alexander. Uh, and of course, the, the brilliant California Coalition for Women Prisoners. So. Um, those folks came together, they had experience doing defense campaigns, um, understanding community accountability, identifying the multiple connections between the experiences of domestic and sexual violence and policing in prison through uh, understanding the criminalization of survival. Right? Um, so just to give you a little bit more orientation about why the panel is called Survive and Punish. So maybe that was, uh, that was great. I would like for you um, to talk a little bit more about transformative justice. Um, but first I'm gonna hand the mic to Lydia. <laughs> so, um, I do wanna share first that, uh, I share these, our stories from a place of power and a, a place of knowing, right? And a place, uh, a power that comes from collective self-determination, right? Um, is led by LGBTQ, queer and trans people of color, um, and we have a membership-based organization um, that supports survivors' leadership um, to do organizing around uh, the issues that affect our communities. So. We um, at Kua support self-determination through wellness, so peer advocacy, counseling, healing spaces. That is crucial in order for us to be able to go out and fight in the streets. Yes. Um, we can't do that when we're hurting. We can do that when we're hurting, but it's going to look very different. Um, and it's more powerful when we, when we stop and pause and take care of ourselves and take care of our community. Um, so that can look like in, in many different ways at Kua. We, we have groups, support groups, where we talk about um, our, our survival, where we talk and honor our past, whether our mistakes, and celebrate that, and find insight in that to move forward. Um, and then we also do culture shift work, um, and we do that through uh, celebrating, you know, celebrating our resistance, celebrating our culture, uh, and, um, and then we have our organizing organizing work, uh, we do that through coalitions, 
Um, so we're part of the Free SF uh, Coalition, which is an immigrant rights coalition. I think there are some folks from the panel that talked a little bit about that. But um, Co-op did work around the uh, due process for all um, and uh, sanctuary city ordinance. Um, so that stopped uh, police and ICE collaboration. Of course, there's some amendments that um, that uh, um, don't protect, it doesn't protect everyone, right? Um, especially if it's a, a great bodily injury, a physical um, assault that they've been convicted for. Kuwab, we tried really hard to fight for that. Um, we uh, got fight for, for all of us to be included, right? Um, and so we know that, that through coalitions, there's limitations, right? Um, so we uh, do the best we can to, to bring forth this anti-criminalization lens and anti-oppression lens in our coalition work. Um, but we also, we're also part of another coalition that is a known USF jail coalition. Um, we recently defeated uh, the, the jail construction, proposal to the uh, new jail um, being constructed in San Francisco. Um, we, after we defeated that, um, there was a, a work group that was put together um, to look at alternatives to um, incarceration, alternatives to, to building this, this jail. Um, and there was folks that were involved, like the district attorney's office and so and so, so things got really, really messy and muddy and, and nothing actually really came out of it, to be honest. Um, so Kuaf, we, we got together with other organizations like TGIJP um, and uh, Lyric and Ella para Trans Latinas, um, and we created this film um, that uh, was called Free from Cages, and it was uh, interviews of uh, transgender women um, uh, sharing their experience of uh, policing and criminalization. Um, and they also shared what they envision um, and what, what, what uh, the city needs to do to invest in services that, um, that meet uh, their needs and that, that, uh, that support their, their uh, wellness. Um, so, yeah, you can find that on Vimeo um, and, uh, or YouTube. Um, it's called Free From Cages. Um, and we did that out of, uh, we, we got some funding uh, to do campaign work. Um, and we, we noticed that a lot of our participants weren't able to come to the streets um, to, to, to protest and to go to rallies. And they just weren't having it. They're like, I'm not going to show up here. Uh, there's people that don't look like me that are in these fights. Um, so, but I will, you know, let you interview me and I'll share what, what I... What I know needs to be done to protect our community. And so we had to be creative about how we do organizing. Um, and we're still exploring what that, what that can look like. Um, and also looking at what organizing is, um, wellness organizing. How do we organize around wellness? That's great. Wow. Thank you. Yes. I also just was really struck by the ways in which Kuab is um, bringing together multiple kinds of violence. You had said earlier that you support survivors of hate crimes, of uh, police brutality, and of domestic and sexual violence. I mean, I think you're one of the few organizations that I know that's sort of consciously and intention intentionally pull those things together, which sounds like it creates space for you to think more expansively about strategies. Yes, and I will say that um, most of the people that come to Kuwab come uh, not because of not because of uh, the police violence that they've experienced. They come to Kuwab because they've experienced domestic violence and, and uh, hate violence. But when they come to Kuwab, there is a space to talk about the the violence that they experience that is so normalized that we're like, well, that's not violence, right? Mm -hmm. So so I'm just gonna be I'm here yes. for this reason. So um, that's so many of our participants, our members have, if not all, have experienced um, violence from the police. So thank you very much. Romerlin, can you talk to us a little bit about 
the connections between police violence inside and outside of prison, and how and how that invites us to think about organizing strategies. Thank you, uh, Alisa. Um, my first introduction to, to organizing and anti-violence work was in the prison. Um, in 1989, um, a, a group of women um, within the prison created an organization called Convicted Women Against Abuse. And so it, it started there for me as being a member of that organization and understanding what violence is, what trauma is, and, and how we were all connected to trauma and, um, and to violence, and how that was cycling um, women in to prison um, in, in the late 80s. And so Convicted Women Against Abuse was kind of the catalyst uh, within the prison to kind of launch a lot of other organizations around uh, doing anti-violence work. Because we know that those um, closest to the problems, closest to the solution. Um, and furthest from resources, and, and we needed to be a part of the conversation in order to um, create a space that would not only uh, protect us, but also to protect other women uh, from coming uh, to places like prison. And so from, C from uh, CWAA, yeah, we created uh, other organizations, the African American Women Prisons Association, where we were also engaged in doing anti-violence work and cultural work and connecting with the community and sharing our stories and changing the narrative around how women end up in cages. You know, what are the pathways? These, it, was, it was misunderstood at the time um, that women have different pathways to incarceration than men. We were all kind of lumped into this, this one gender idea of that folks commit crimes because they want to commit crimes. And that's not true for women. It was, it was because of a lot of the social conditions within our communities, the lack of protection from law enforcement and police. Um, during the 70s and 80s, when you would call these situations would be considered family disputes. And there was cooling off periods um, that the, the man or sometimes the woman was asked to leave their home and take a lap around the block as a, a cooling off period, but no one was, you know, um, uh, told that this was a violent situation and that this was, this was violence against women. We all kind of accepted this as this is like what relationships are about, the ups and downs, the kind of you told Harpo to beat me situation. You know, and so when when we all ended up in prison in the in the eighties and in the early nineties, we realized that something was seriously wrong with the way that we had been processed and the way that we had been convicted. And so our organizing grew from understanding that collectively we could change the system. And so CCWP then was born out of that um, collective energy and, and agency. And you talk about taking back, um, during the early 90s, it was, it was very powerful with, within the, the two now prisons that um, we had back then and around not only domestic violence issues, but also medical issues, because many of us were suffering now from mental health issues and uh, physical issues, illnesses that were brought on by the violence and trauma that we had experienced in our lives. And CCWP was, was the catalyst for creating the movement um, from inside the prison to the community. And so now we see all these really great organizations now SVP for uh, Free Bad Women was a part of that um, with the great Emily Harris in the audience uh, who worked on my campaign uh, back in the early 90s. And so the organizing inside the prison was very powerful and um, we were able to get the attention of the California uh, legislators to come inside and then hold panels. 
and do inquiries and have interviews to find out what was actually happening. And then Gloria Aubrey got involved, of course, and then, and then we were able to create some protection, the intimate partner violence. And so things started to happen um, because women inside these prisons across the country were speaking out mm -hmm. and sharing their stories and their narratives. And that's what's so important about coming to spaces like this and being able to participate alongside all of these, these wonderful people and share our stories because those who have this lived experience is, are the change makers, are able to give insight into what is really needed to um, not only change the law, but change the practices and the mindsets of folks and how we organize to protect our communities. And now, um, with uh, all of these other groups being part of the anti-violence movement and looking at ways that, um, that juvenile justice is a part of it, uh, we need to think about how we're raising you know, folks in our communities to become the next group of incarcerated people. It, prisons are not a naturalized place. They're not normal. They're not supposed to be prisons. They're not supposed to be human beings living in cages. Yes. And so prison abolition is very, very important to, for us to really think about how can we shut down the carceral system, yes. not just you know, create these very modest reforms, right. mm -hmm. but how can we seriously look at shutting down prisons? Yes. And we, we've talked a lot about um, different ways to do that. And one thing that kept coming to my mind is that uh, a quote from uh, Audre Lorde is that we can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Mm -hmm. And yes. so we have to start reimagining and uh, envisioning yes. something different. Yes. And collectively, I, I, I know we can do that. Um, but the policing and the surveillance inside is, is constant. You know, it's, it's so traumatizing for a person inside the prison who's been um, victimized most of their lives, sexually, emotionally, and mentally, to have, and I was sharing um, yesterday with someone, to have these um, sensory, um, um, I, I don't know what to call it, um, punishments, the, the lights constantly on in the prison. The jingling of the keys, um, knowing that you're being watched, the strip searches, um, the escorts, uh, the, the PA system announcing what to do, when to do all the time, and the buildup of that over years or decades, you know, is extremely damaging to a person's mental health. And so we need to uh, also think about how do we support a survivor when they are released? What do we do? How do we connect to someone who's been traumatized in a way that very few people can understand? You know, it's organizations like the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, CCWP, and Survive and Punish that invite women who have, and transgender um, individuals who have this lived experience to create a community on the outside so that we are supported, so that we have a place where we feel safe, and so that there's um, an environment where we can be brave and share our narratives to push legislation and to push change. And, you know, I, I think that's where this whole movement is, is, is lacking um, the camaraderie. You know, there is kind of three prong for me. You know, there's prevention, uh, of course, there's intervention, and then there's, there's bringing the community back together, or what folks like to call um, reintegration, <laughs> however you, know, you want to define that. But how do, how do you bring us back into the community without stigmatizing 
without um, isolating or without triggering and re-traumatizing us. Because even when we get up on these stages and we talk about our experiences, those are triggers for us. Those are triggers for me. You know, and there's a degree of re-traumatization that happens yeah. when we share. Yes. And so, what are the healing spaces available? And thank you for that healing space and the altar. Very beautiful to have in this space. Mm -hmm. But to be mindful, you know, of that, our experiences with inside these cages is, is something that we can't even explain. And although we get out and we pretend like we're functioning normally, mm -hmm. and we're able to accomplish and do a lot of things, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a lot of performance mm -hmm. in that. And so I share that with you to say, in doing this work uh, that we're all doing in this room, care is so important, mm -hmm. kindness it's so important to welcome us back into the community. It's so important that that, that welcoming um, should, should look, you know, like an open space. Like we're glad to not only have you here, but we also want to know not just the why this happened, but what happened and how can we help you. Nahi, um, I've, I've heard you speak several times um, and always been blown away. But one of the things that's been consistent and when you talk about your experiences is that you, um, you, you ask the audience, what kind of sense does it make to arrest, to arrest me, to take my child from me, to, uh, you know, to basically treat me as if I'm the, the violent individual here, right? And I so appreciate that question about what kind of sense it makes because it makes me think that it reminds me that these different systems are creating a sense, right? And you're constantly pushing against it. My question is, um, did, you, did you see opportunities for creating your own alternative sense? Did the Stand With Not He campaign uh, affirm you and your and your own experience of the situation um, in light and in pressure of the of the the uh, the carceral sense, right? The sense that ICE detention was saying um, was was real, right? Does that make sense? Okay. I want to talk too many things, so I try to keep it easy. All right. First, I believe. Like, this society is way complicated than before. That's why we made a vote. That's what I believe. Because before, like a long time ago, human being doesn't have a law, right? Because the society is so small, so we can just talk. Oh, what do you think? I think this way. Like, you know, they couldn't figure it out. But now, this society is so big, so we made a law, and we believe that law work for justice, right? But if that law and the system doesn't work for justice, what is that for? I believe after that happened, it's like it was a turning point of my life. Because anyone and anytime and anywhere you can be in you can you can be in incarcerated because they have too much power, so they if they want you to convict it, you could be, you could be just go to jail like that. Because what we believe, like the police and like prosecutor, judge, those kind of people should work for justice, right? But. It's not. But probably still many people want to believe and maybe they believe that way. But I was in jail and I saw it's not like that way. It's like people, many people believe 
some people who is in jail, that means they made something wrong or you know they did something bad thing. But actually, it's not that way. It's like some people who doesn't have power or poor or isn't educated or colored. Those kind of people in jail. Most of people in jail. So how we can change it? Even is it possible to change it? I'm not sure that part. But still, like it's a little bit maybe different. I don't know how I can explain the whole of my idea, but like uh, domestic violence, for example. Domestic violence. Many times the people doesn't know how can how we have to do for that case, right? If that happened, we don't know what to do. Even you, you know what? Like when I when I when I was in convicted and then when I had a trial, how the prosecutor told me what what he told me. He said that I'm educated and I'm smart enough to figure out if there is domestic violence. I could have find some resource or some place I can, you know, be safe. What? So everything is my fault because I, I couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. You know. So, like domestic violence case, I I, I want to believe this way. If there is some crazy dumb shit dog, <laughs> and then if the dog tried to bite you. We shouldn't think about it. We shouldn't think like, oh, why the dog want to bite me? No. What do we have to do? Run away or have to fight it, right? Fight back. But I think like if we think a little bit more wider, maybe it's this kind of law system is like that kind of stupid dog. <laughs> I tried. So we shouldn't just run away, right? We have to fight that. But I don't know how yet, but no, we are smart. We can fight that. Right? Every time you call them stupid, it gets me smart twice. Um, and then we'll we'll close with Mimi. Um, so Mimi. You've been doing transformative justice and accountability for many years. And uh, I'm wondering how that work creates an alternative sense, right? And so the ways in which you, carceral creep shows us how a carceral sense becomes a common sense. I'm wondering how your work creates space for a freedom sense, right? Uh, well, I'm, I want to keep this brief because I think that's all going to be also going to be addressed in the next panel. I can just say when some of us started doing this work as an alternative, what we found was we were creating alternatives that look very much like um, the criminal legal system. We were doing investigations. We were trying to come up with punitive policies, you know, banning people. And it was I really think that some of us we could, we got together and kind of shared what we have been doing. And this is all within the social justice. Um, primarily people of color community. I'm oh like, my God, we are really coming up with things that, we, you know, we have so lost the imagination to think of anything else, that we are creating an alternative that looks like a parallel system. Um, so that, I think there's been, a, 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 there was that realization, then there's been um, really, a, uh, I think the work over the last few years has really been trying to figure out what does justice look like when it's I mean, truly looking towards liberation and having and not looking at the end of harm or even just harm reduction as the goal, but to actually have liberation as the goal. And that's, um, you know, some of us I think have been able to do that better than others. Maybe that, uh, for example, me and is going to be coming up here because I think that the work of Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective is really um, how it really embodies the kind of liber liberatory spirit we're looking at in terms of transformative justice. Um, but there's many of us that have we talked together and we're like, what did we come up with? What does that look like when you turn to somebody that you hate 
but with compassion because you still want to keep them in your community. These discussions are about, are people disposable? Um, Marion Cabo's article even on Nasser, is Nasser's imprisonment, is that transformative justice? No, it is not. And it actually, if we had transformative justice, we would not have a Nasser, we wouldn't have that situation. We wouldn't have a situation where somebody repeatedly violates somebody and probably was violated himself at one time with nobody doing anything. So we're really looking at something also that's, um, uh, that's, that's looking towards the future and we have to have glimmers of that right now in the way that we face the violence that we, um, I mean, what I really love and I think is so challenging about transformative justice work and we also look at harms that we do to each other, <coughs> is we really have to look differently. We can't just throw people out. We actually have to um, call attention to violence and harm, but we have to come at the solution to it from a liberatory stance. Um, that's very difficult to do. It's really been challenging. I think the 600-page toolkit was some attempt to like, maybe this, well, what about that, you know? Um, so, but I can see over time and talking to different people, and I don't know how many people here feel like you've been part of that movement or have been trying your own struggles. Yes, so I'm sure everybody that does, and there's one hand, but all of you have, <laughs> even if it was with your friend last week, okay? So, um, uh, you know, that, Anybody who's been doing it knows it's challenging, and yet we are, I, I, as I hear more and more stories of success, I know I'm getting closer to that, and we just have to share those stories, because those are stories that people do not want us to share. We don't want to identify them as a way that we're going to deal with violence. So let's, let's build um, up those alternatives and have all hope.